right? <laughs> um, welcome, everyone. Good to have you here at worship. And for those of you that are worshiping online, welcome to you as well. It's good to be here. It's good to be the church. Ah, here I come. I've got a voice. There we go. Uh, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about it if you haven't already heard. Uh, the, the winner of the Kentucky Derby this year, uh, Rich Strike, uh, correct me if I get that wrong throughout because I've been calling him Rich Stakes in my mind for, for the last four hours. Uh, Rich Strike uh, was, oh, thank you so much, Pete. And you know what? Pete has got me in both hands here again. Thank you so much. Um, and so Rich Strike uh, was uh, purchased at a, uh, it's called a claims race, which means that what they do with a claims race is uh, the owner puts the horse in the race and puts price on the horse and at the, uh, while the race is going on and after the race, anybody can claim him. As long as they put up the money, it's their horse. Uh, Rich Strike was uh, purchased at that race for $30,000, which to you and me sounds like a lot of money, uh, but in that world of horse racing, horses go for millions, especially horses with, uh, with pedigrees like they have. Pedigrees, is that the word I use? Whatever. You know what I'm talking about. So the previous owner, previous trainer, uh, had an eye for this sort of thing. In fact, the previous trainer had, has a record 10 Kentucky Derby wins. And he looks at Rich Strike and says, this horse is going on the auction block. The new owner, a guy by the name of Dawson, he uh, is, um, he's tired of racing, he's not doing very well, he's kind of disillusioned as he said himself. And so on the advice, but on the advice of his trainer, uh, a guy by the name of Reed, Eric Reed, he decides I'm going to make one more go of it. I like this guy Reed and, and so he says I'm going to put my money on Rich Strike. Okay. Uh, by the way, seven races, one win, two shows, which is third place, and the last time he raced before the Derby, he was racing against Epicenter, the, uh, the, the uh, favorite. Epicenter beat him by 14 lengths, okay? So that trainer, by the way, Eric Reed, um, he probably shouldn't have been in the business anymore either. Back in 2016, um, he had a barn fire, big barn fire, lost 23 horses that were under his care. And he was so devastated, he just about got out himself. And so here comes the race, and or before the race, and Rich Strike is the 21st horse in a field of 20 horses. So up until the last 30 seconds, he was not going to race. The 20th horse was taken out of the race, 30 seconds left before the deadline, Rich Strike is in. Had that not happened, it would have been a very different race. Right? His odds were 80 to 1, which means if you bought a $2 ticket, that $2 would return to you $160. Okay, figure it out. If you bought a $1,000 ticket, yeah, 80 grand, okay? Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is a long shot to beat all long shots if he wins. Well, if you had not seen the race before, you just did. And by the way, did you notice that uh, the guy who's calling the race, before the last couple seconds of the race, and even, well, before the last couple seconds of the race, Rich Strike's name is only mentioned once by the, by the person who calls the race. And he's so confused at the end of the race, Rich Strike is past all the other horses, and this guy has to look down and figure out what horse it is that's beating Epicenter. He can't figure it out. So here's what we have. And by the way, we are going to get to the Bible soon. Don't worry. Okay? Um, we, have a, um, we, we have an owner who is disillusioned and just wants out. We have a trainer who has faced disaster and probably shouldn't be there. Didn't mention the jockey, but never been in a race like this before. And, according to the guy who calls the race, we had a horse with no name. A $30,000 horse with no name. Who saw this coming? By the way, this might be a fact you don't know. That $30,000 horse earned $1,860,000 for the win of the Kentucky Derby. Let's stop there.
say, let, let's get to the lesson now. So uh, the lesson comes from uh, John chapter 21. Thank you, by the way, very much for reading. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's after the resurrection, right? And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a lesson that is just rich with imagery. So much so that you don't really know which way to go. I mean, you've got, um, uh, you've got casting the nets on the right side. That probably means something, right? You have um, a net so full of fish that they can't haul it in. Probably means something, right? Uh, they, uh, they, but the net doesn't break. Probably means something. And you've got Jesus on the beach with a charcoal fire ready to serve them breakfast. Probably means something. Uh, but today, for whatever reason, this week, that number that appears in this lesson has um, been sticking in my craw. The number is 153. I don't know why it sticks in my craw, except that it's maybe j it just sounds random. I mean, why 153? Maybe you've asked the same questions. Well, are you ready to be bored? Here we go. Because uh, there are... Bible scholars galore out there that have all kinds of answers to that question. And so if you're a numbers kind of person, 153 is kind of a funky number. If you take the numbers 1 through 17 and add them together, 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 17, guess what you get? 153, right? It's also something called a triangular number. Shelby, would you please put this up? You have... 153 dots, and you arrange them like this, and you get a, an equilateral triangle. And guess how many dots are on each side? 17, 17, 17. I don't know. Okay. Uh, somebody thought that was important enough to put it in their Bible study. All right, so then there's also something called, um, I've never heard this number before, this w word before, but a narcissistic number. So if you take each of the digits of 153 and take them to the third power, one to the third power, five to the third power, three to the third power, and add them all together, what do you get? 153. Uh, and then finally, this is also something called a Friedman number. So if you take 51 times 3, guess what you get? You can say it out loud with me. 153. That's exactly right. Uh, have you guys had enough? Because there is more if you'd like. I know I have. Bible scholars have not, however, because they just dig into this stuff, and they're, they're looking and finding and explaining and giving all kinds of reasons why that is significant. There are other things about this number that are kind of cool. And, and these are actually kind of cool. 153, at that time, was the number of known nations in the world. Here's another one, kind of cool. 153 was the number of known species of fish in the world. That one seems to have more possibilities for a sermon to me. Uh, maybe I just need to st st study the numbers game a little bit more. But, you know, of all of these and others that I haven't mentioned, the explanation I like the best, or the take I like the best, is from somebody called Caroline Lewis. She's a professor up at Luther Seminary. And she says, why can't 153 just be a lot of fish? I like that. Because, you know, what's happened here is that in the midst of all that's happened with the disciples, here comes this abundance, unexplained and unanticipated abundance. Abundance like no one could possibly ever imagine. Right? Um, yeah, an abundance. That's not uh, the only place in John where you find this theme, by the way. So if you go to chapter 1, you'll see that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of truth and grace, and through him we will have grace upon grace, abundance. From there we go to, guess what? A wedding where the wine runs out, and there are 
six stone jars, each of them holding 30 gallons, and out of the uh, 30 gallons of water, excuse me, and out of those six stone jars is dipped not just wine, but the finest of wine. I would imagine, let's see, six times 30, that's 180 gallons. That'd probably do it for any wedding, I would think, right? And then from there, there is, uh, we go to a hillside next to the Sea of Galilee, where 5,000 are seated in the grass, and a little boy with five loaves and two fish come forward. It's the only food there is to be had. And all 5,000 are fed. Abundance in unexpected places. Abundance where abundance shouldn't happen. And so, let me ask again. Why can't 153 fish just be a lot of fish? I mean, that's kind of what the disciples needed at that time. They needed to see an abundance because they were living in a world of lacking. And yes, I know, they had seen Jesus three times before this. Mary Magdalene had seen him on Easter morning. All but Thomas had seen them on Easter evening. And then the following week, everybody, including Thomas, had seen him. But still, there they are, uncertain, not sure which way to go, not, not sure what they should be doing. It's like they are completely rudderless. They are like an owner who is disillusioned and just wants to throw in the towel. They're like a, a trainer who's gone through a devastating tragedy and probably shouldn't be there. They're like a jockey who's never been in the game before. And they're like a horse with no name. Peter says, I'm going fishing. I mean, he doesn't know which way to turn, so turn back. He was a fisherman before. He knew that gig. And now Jesus is gone, and they had no direction whatsoever. They would had these appearances, but no direction whatsoever. And they just don't know what to do with themselves or where to go. So the natural thing is to go back to where they came from. Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the other disciples said, we'll go with you. And guess what they caught that night? Zippo. And I will tell you that when that happens, every time that happens, when you are lost, when you are alone, when you're not sure which way to go, when, when you have big decisions to make and you don't know what the right one is, or maybe you're facing something that the doctor has told you that you don't want to face and you don't know what this means, when you're, when you're out there fishing and the number is Zippo, that's when Jesus comes. And he stands on the beach and he calls your name and he says, Toss out your nets one more time. Oh, yeah, I've been there. I've, I've, I've already done that. All night we've been doing that. Right side, left side, it didn't matter. Jesus says, toss it out to the right side one more time. And the abundance comes. It comes there. It comes when things are uncertain. When the, the prevailing winds aren't blowing at all. And you're sitting in the middle of the lake with nothing to fill your sails. It comes when you're not sure, when you don't know what the future holds, when you don't know what you're doing or where you're going or what your purpose in life might be. Oh, there's a good one for some graduates, isn't it? He comes there to offer you peace and life in full abundance, like wine at a wedding, like bread and fish where there is none he comes there let's sing
Thanks, Kathy. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, he comes when and where you least expect it to. I mean, think about this. This is going to last you for the day if you eat nothing else? Probably not. How about that? A half a sip of wine. I mean, literally, a half a sip of wine. It's nothing, right? It's so little. And yet, you have come faithfully, ready to receive it, as not just a taste of the kingdom, but a full banquet, an abundance of forgiveness and new life and hope where there is no hope and promise where promise wears thin. You come to this table and you know this abundance that comes in such a small, small package. Whatever it is that's on your heart, bring it here. Whatever it is that causes you pause or gives you uncertainty or makes you think you probably shouldn't be in the game, bring it here. Because Jesus has a plan for you. He has a plan that um, you maybe don't quite know yet. Yeah, even some of you that are retired, you maybe don't quite know yet. But he's going to call you. And he calls you here first. And he forgives your sins. And he gives you new life. And he does so in an amount that is a thousand times larger than any of your doubts or your trials or your troubles. And it frees you to become the person that God means you, meant you to be. To do the work God intends you to do. To show you a way that you never before thought possible. And for that, we give God thanks and praise. Amen.